Well, it's my pleasure to introduce our next panel and our next moderator, Neeraj Agarwal. You heard his lovely childhood story earlier. Thank you for sharing all your subway experiences. Um, and I'll leave it to him to kick off this panel. Okay. Excellent. OK. I was trying to think back, when is the last time I've had a beer in my hand on a Wednesday at 4 o'clock? And I, I think it might have been college. So this is bringing back very good memories. Um, I'd like to introduce our two panelists, uh, Raji Thomas, the founder and CEO of Sprinkler, and Amir Orad, uh, the CEO of SciSense, which is a business intelligence company. Interestingly, both are actually repeat uh, entrepreneurs, CEOs. Uh, before founding Sprinkler, Raji was a president of Epsilon Interactive Services from 2006 to 2008. Uh, some of you might know that as uh, Bigfoot Interactive. Uh, that was the acquired company. It was in the email marketing space. And a uh, small bit of trivia is that uh, Bigfoot Interactive was actually larger than Exact Target at the time. And uh, I tell Raji that he sold way too early and that we're not going to make that mistake again this time. <laughs> OK. And then prior to SciSense, Amir was a CEO of Nice Actimize which was a $200 million plus company, uh, real scale, um, in the financial crime and analytics software space. Not sure what that means, but that sounds like- Catching getting, bad people. Catching bad people. <laughs> um, but good, you know, and, and to give you a sense, um, when we invested in Sprinkler, there were roughly 10 people, maybe a million dollars of revenue. Today, Sprinkler has over 1,000 people and over $100 million run rate. Uh, and that's all happened in less than five years. So it's been a, been a very exciting journey there. I happen to be on the board. My partner, Itzik, is on the board of SciSense. Um, uh, SciSense, when we invested, was probably 20 or 30 people, low single digit millions. Uh, and Amir just mentioned they just crossed a 200 person mark recently and, and growing very quickly, almost 100% per year. So both companies are growing very quickly, and we're excited to be an investor in, in both of them. So let me, let me start off with the panel. You guys have done this for a while. Right? There are a lot of founders here that are companies, say, sub 100 people. What's the one thing you wish you knew back then that you know today? Raji, I'll start with you. Well, um, I, um, prior to really going through the journey with Sprinkler, um, I had, this is a confession and probably not a good one, I had no respect for um, sales. I should probably stop there, but I just, <laughs> uh, sales engineering. Um, what, what do you mean by that? I mean, what do you mean no respect for sales? What does that, what does that mean? Uh, in sales engineering, because I had, um, in my prior lives, it was hit and miss. You hired salespeople that either worked out or did, did not work out. Um, and, and, you know, with my sort of product background, um, I almost always took that for granted, as, as that's like how it is. Sales cowboys, they show up, keep your fingers crossed, you get a good one, they hit your number, you get the entire company to help them. Um, with, with Sprinkler and with given our ambition, uh, and we are fairly unapologetically ambitious as a company, um, you know, we, we, we've taken a very different approach of engineering, architecting, um, sales infrastructure of which people is a part of uh, is one people people are a big but one uh, part um, and that's one thing the respect for sales and sales architecture and sales infrastructure did not have before now i do uh, that's one thing i learned good and just rough numbers of sales people you have just give you a um about 250 to 300 people supporting in the sales missionary side uh, about 75, 77 code carrying sales reps. Okay, great. And they're all typically field reps, right? That type of model. They're okay. uh, spread around the world. Good. Yeah. I'll share two, two experiences I had. And my previous company was all enterprise field sales, large ticket items. And the current one is all one, you know, inbound phone uh, telesales, right? Inside sales. So in my early life, I was a pre-sale guy, product guy, pre-sale guy, and I recall going to the first few deals, and I came in and did my, my show, and I really convinced the client to buy. And I thought I was the sales guy. And then this guy came in and did some negotiation, and he closed, technically closed the deal. I was the sales guy. The other guy was almost a, just a closer. And that's what I thought sales is. Early, this is like a long time ago, three companies ago. It took me many years to realize and appreciate the difference between convincing the client as the 
product founder techie evangelist that they want this and closing the, the damn deal. Because the distance is, is tremendous. So that's one, one insight. And I also realized there are so many types of salespeople and there's not one single, and this is still enterprise sales, which is more cowboy uh, mentality. Some don't have a clue what they're selling and they're closing really impressive deals. However, others are geniuses. They really understand the product and they close it that way. The third type is all about relationships, right? So there's no one unique way when you have field enterprise sales. There are multiple legitimate, acceptable ways. And sales is not just convincing the client they want the product. That's one ingredient among many. That was kind of one big lesson. And the second one, actually joining SciSense, um, I thought it's impossible to sell to a large Fortune 100 company, a six, uh, heavy duty six digit ACV transaction over the phone without meeting them within a few weeks. And I was shocked when I joined over and kind of became the CEO to find out it's extremely possible these days. We are closing multiple deals every, every month, six digits and above, hundreds of thousands ACV over the phone within a few weeks at Fortune 100 companies without ever meeting them, without anyone, you know, anyone flying there, without anything, by having a structured, repetitive, clear process with value added to the client. So to me, two extreme sides, both shockingly surprising, but now I believe both are doable with the right product and company. Good, good. You know, you guys oh, unfortunately missed the last panel about bottoms up selling. And as a VC, I have hundreds of companies come in every year and they all say, hey, we're gonna be like Atlassian. We're gonna be like Slack. We don't need salespeople. They're overpaid. I don't know what they do. Why do you guys think you need salespeople? Why don't we talk about that? Should we even have salespeople in the 21st century? Um, the, the, the answer is yes, uh, at least for depending on what you do. Uh, it's tempting to, to look at someone, um, read an S1 and go, well, those margins are incredible, I'd like to have that. But I think the key is to understand your product and understand the buying process within a company for your product. Um, and for a product that needs to, to pass um, compliance, that needs to pass security audits, um, it would be very naive to assume that someone being impressed by the belts and whistles and finding someone with a need and finding that he's got a budget is a surefire way to, to make a sale. Quite the opposite, as you mentioned, it, it's really the beginning of the process. Um, so depending on what you sell and who you're selling to, you have to align your selling process. And if your selling process involves multiple parties on the other side um, and has um, extra product process and uh, um, work to do, then I, I think you, you would need a sales team and you would need to scale it. And the other part of that is, uh, you know, nothing happens until there, you sell something. So you, you, the rest of the organization in terms of planning, building, hitting your goals, um, you, if you just, take your, and we all do this when we're doing, I, I did this for my first startup, you know, like, look at how much have we sold in the first 12 months, how much can you sell with five people, you multiply the productivity model. Um, and it, it doesn't work that way without a great sales process and sales mm -hmm. engineering. I actually th I think the question is a bit naive or irrelevant. Thank it's you. like, do you need an umbrella? <laughs> is it raining, not raining, sunny, not sunny? Do I like because it's getting wet? It's, it's a very abstract question. And the sales team does, Roughly, in my view, three things. They get in and capture the attention. It can be done in other ways, marketing, right, and so on. But that's one thing. Get in, capture the attention. Then it's demonstrating value that has a price tag to it, not generic value, right? Value that has a price tag. And then it's navigating the mechanical steps to close a deal, which could be compliance and security, politics, contracts, SLAs, what have you. You can achieve in different ways the different steps in the, of the process. The question is, what's the most cost-effective one for you? So if you can get in with tremendous buzz and marketing, and if the value is just instant, you just see that it, you know, it prints money, right? And if the contract is one line and it's free, you don't need the sales guy. So, and I think you need to maximize, ask the question in the context of what you're trying to achieve in your product, in your industry, in your strategic direction, um, and then answer the question, and then which type of salesperson, right? Inside, outbound, inbound, and so on and so on. Otherwise, it's, it's generic. I, I would just add one more dimension to it. A good salesperson 
is, your, is a big part of your retention strategy. Um, so while it might be all the three things you said, mm -hmm. get and show value, there is life for businesses like us where ARR is our primary metric. And you know, keeping that retention you know, at 95% or above is really what drives uh, our growth and valuation. So otherwise it's a leaky bucket. And, 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 the, and the, the, what's usually missing with trying to just get in because someone was impressed is that person leaves and you lose the deal. Or after some time, you know, something changes and you couldn't keep up with it. So, so I respectfully fully disagree, um, not with the need, but with the way to achieve it. I moved away already two companies. Sales do not own the account and the retention in the account after they close the deal. Yeah. I've done it with the largest banks and the smallest accounts. I think sales are, I'll quote a VP sales I had, coin, coin operated machines. Okay, that's his quote about his own, himself and his people. And then he asked for a raise. Um, coin operated machines and you should not sell someone the need to renew your contract. You should give him value and satisfaction so the renewal comes automatically. That's my view as a CEO. And shame on you if you don't see the value of the product. Now sometimes, unfortunately, it's not clear enough and we all have bugs and issues and so on. Um, so I prefer to put customer success type people, call them account managers, etc., measured on satisfaction, measured on renewals. They truly want the, the success of the client yeah. more than close the renewal to get commission and establish a baseline for growth and expansion, which is where you need more sales type you know, relationships. Just one question on this topic, this comes up in every company. Where does the function of upsell and renewal live? Does it live in sales ultimately? Does it report to the same person? Or are we talking two different people that report to the CEO? T t tell me your thoughts on that. In my in current life and the last company at the end, renewals are not owned by sales. They're owned by customer success or account management. Um, which today do not roll up to sales at all, roll up to a global team. customer success head. Upsells and expansions are more tricky, and I made it even more complex, and each company debates it, and I, I actually all the time talk to my peers to see where is the industry. In my view, organic expansions, you don't need to sell them. Obviously, if you don't have enough seats in the car, you need to add a seat. You don't need to sell you the need for the seat, you just need a seat. So expansion is natural and comes with the responsibility of the day-to-day -day relationship. Finding new users and new use cases and new departments you need to sell, and end of the day we pull in the sales guy to have that process. So I, that's where I divide the line. There are many legitimate ways. It's not a one size, uh, you know. But that's sales and customer success report to you as CEO. To me. Okay. I also don't have a global VP sales. I think that's also foolish. That's my <laughs> craziness. I've done that for $200 million. I find those guys, CROs, to be distancing me from the, the, you know, the reality. Um, I find them adding another layer of abstraction, which I think is unhealthy for the organization. And um, I chose not to do it, but that's my personal craziness. Again, other people, it's as legit for other people. I chose not to do it. I found benefits in it. Yeah, no, it makes sense because you come from a sales background. I'm actually an engineer. But. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we do the same thing. We have a success organization that reports you know, up, uh, up the hierarchy all the way. Um, you're absolutely right in that sales and success should be split out. We do the same. Um, and as anyone who's done multiple startups will, on the enterprise space will tell you that. Um, but what we have realized and, and what we have now solved, it, it was a tough thing to solve. Um, and I went through the same struggle of, you know, hey, the customer is buying more and you didn't do anything. So um, the first realization was we have a genius sales leader on the board um, that once said to me, Raji, a dollar is a dollar. <laughs> okay, it took me three years to understand that fully, but what he meant to say that uh, was that don't try to split uh, and find out who actually causes and how it was caused. Just keep paying and because all you care about is the growth and the account. So. Um, what we did, and, and, and you, um, what you said before, what we've done is success is responsible for measuring the happiness of the client, yeah. but what we always find is our experience, right? People in success are in success for a reason because they don't want to be a sales guy. This guy is making 3x your money. Like, why wouldn't you want to be this guy? I don't know because I like to be a success guy. 
Now, the success guy is all about love and happiness, which we want love and happiness. Mm -hmm. The problem with love and happiness is they're not looking around the corner. They're not seeing the new boss that just came in. So what we have done is a dollar is a dollar. Everyone gets paid. Success keeps clients happy. The other guy lurks in and out, watching for um, wild animals uh, around the food. And and, and to be clear, customer sales and customer success Report to one executive that reports. Yeah, so so we have what we've done, and again through evolution, we're in a good place now. Um, the entire front office, as we call it, which is a favorite concept of ours, um, sales, partnerships, marketing, success, all report to our president and, and, and chief operating officer, who is a someone who has built a fourteen billion dollar business. So it reports up to the right right place. So two thoughts on on, on that. First of all, it took me a few years to accept double commissions, right? Or uh, uh, the fact you pay two people, and on, until I realized when you run the Excel, it actually means nothing, because the OT is the same. So if you do the math, paying twice or three times or 10 times change nothing to the budget, because you end up setting the OTs accordingly in the targets. So as you think about it, it's not really as painful as it's- For seems. engineers, it's very hard. <laughs> but but, but when, when, run the math, guys. It, 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 pay, it, it hurts you, right, that you pay two, two people for the same action. It doesn't ma- matter at the end because their targets are accordingly, and the OT is set in advance, right? Um, so I do pay for selective strategic accounts. I put two in the box, but for other accounts, I want people to run and get logos and build a business, and the success guys to do that. The other thing we did, which we found very useful, we measure our customer success guys on identifying new opportunities. We call it lead generation, right? We're not measured on closing the opportunities and the dollar value, because then we become salespeople that, that nickel and dime the account. But they are measured on identifying new opportunities, i.e. the leads they generate. And to us, that's a, that's a target they have, and we found it to be, again, a way to balance the two. They used to be measured on dollars, and they became, they just convert to be a sales guy, and the customer feels it. They, they sense that you're really looking for, to make money on his back, and they don't like it. But again, there are a thousand permutations to this discussion. They're all valid. Just understand exactly where the line is. There is a line somewhere in responsibilities and how you motivate everyone, because you want to achieve dollars. Let, let me move on to the next topic to, to keep it moving. Um, I want to talk, I mean, I want to talk about pricing. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the recent things you've been doing on pricing and give folks a sense of, of deal size for you guys, uh, just no, folks with sprinklers in the 100K average deal size, a little above that? 180. 180, just to give a sense of. 80% where, off. Yeah, so talk about where, 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 <laughs> where you're uh, at and some of the recent learnings you've had. Okay, so I'm a, I'm a bit crazy, but I own pricing in the company. That's my philosophy. I think pricing is a communication vehicle, not just a dollar amount. It communicates value, it aligns value to, to price. You have to align all the interests of the company. Um, so it's either the head of product or kind of almost someone at that level to oversee everything. And l- lately we've done an interesting change. We actually raised our minimum price by 100% as a way to filter out customers who are not strategically interested in my, my product. From what to what? Just give people context. From low tens of thousands to high tens of thousands. And um, the goal was it was a business decision, not a pricing decision. It was nothing to do with price. It was a business decision to filter out customers who are unable to commit early on so I don't commit too much to them only to find them churned because they don't care. So it was, again, to me it's a communication vehicle more than a, a, just a dollar amount. The other thing we change it, you know, you always have servers, users, capacity, different ways. How do you align your business messaging to the pricing? If you claim you're number one at X, is pricing aligned with X? Because if you're number one at X and the unit cost is Y, then you get a misalignment in the field between where you have the most value and where you capture the most money. So I mean, those were the two big. Well, things. isn't it isn't it obvious you should have higher deal size? You know, wh- wh- why no. was you know? No. So talk about the other side. What what was higher the deal sizes? You have more friction. You have less new logos, right? You have more risk volatility within a deal. So the deal size should be the right one to balance penetration and friction with maximization, right, and uh, commi- mutual commitment. If they commit to, I also had $10 million deals in my past, but those cannot fail. Someone will be fired, right, if they fail. So the deal size helps you get commitment from the other side. The length of the contract, three years, one year, make a big difference. No out versus out makes a huge difference, et cetera, et cetera. And for what it's worth, I've noticed in my experience that the 20K and less deals, you know, might renew at, 60% renewal rate in some of my companies, but at 20K above, it might be 80, 90%. And like, there's a dramatic difference. So we did a chart rate. showing the deal size. Yeah, we did a churn versus the deal size, the penetration deal size, not over time. 
You can clearly see reverse correlation. It makes sense. It's just obvious. The more you commit, the more you try to make it work. If you spend five bucks, who cares? You guys are talking ACV. 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 I'm talking ACV. Yeah. Um, I've uh, pricing, you know, for, for a lot of people is a revenue optimization exercise. I've always thought of, uh, of pricing as a value optimization exercise. Um, and it's, it's a relatively new school of thought, if you ask me. Um, because traditionally, especially in B2B enterprise world, um, I've had a lot of people tell me, well, you can charge a lot more. Um, the problem is there's, I call it good revenue and bad revenue. Good, uh, good revenue is revenue that sticks and grows. Bad revenue is, is, makes you like not sleep well. Um, when your primary numbers are ARR, um, retention is a big part because you're adding to the pie every year. Um, so it's very tempting to take bad revenue because someone had extra budget or was a great sales guy or you disproportionate value perception. Um, but the problem is you're bringing bad revenue in. Um, and now I'm just deathly afraid of that. So I buy into the value optimization model where I look at the value that I can create for a client very measurably. Um, and, and you know, you can bake margins into it or not. But um, regardless, when you go against value, then you have a very defensible pricing mechanism. And if you want to see a classic example of how to do this really well, um, you should look at Amazon um, AWS pricing. Well, they proactively give you discounts and bring the price down as you, as you move higher. Um, and what that allows you to do is it puts you in a very defensible position. And if, if the internet and social should teach you anything, it's that the, the, the defensible, the differentiators are going down every day um, and loyalty is, is much harder. So what you really want to do is price above value so that it's, if you have enough scale and you are a optimized execution engine, then it's very hard for anyone else to ever come threaten you. You get stuck on revenue, you start going down the slippery slope, then you're screwed. Hey, well, I'm gonna open up the question in a sec. I, I one thing to add, just I, I'm 100% in agreement, and I would add one more thing. Simplification of the pricing, which is exactly not optimizing revenue, but optimizing simplicity, velocity, and so on, is huge. Most people and us as CEOs are tempted to add another module, add another line, add another dimension to max out 10% of the deals. It hurts the company, it hurts the business, slows down the business. So I'm with you, don't over complex it, keep it aligned, don't try to optimize it all the way to the end because it blows up in your face later on. And it slows growth. Hey, Raj, you, you mentioned customer success. I'd like you to just share some of your lessons on CDAP, if you can explain what that is for the folks, and then I'm gonna open up the questions. Um, so we have this sort of bordering unhealthy obsession with keeping clients happy. Um, and. And I did that for selfish reasons because I get upset when people get upset. And I've noticed that people get upset when clients get upset. <laughs> so it gets this, uh, into, you get into this vicious cycle of, uh, you know, clients are upset, you don't want to deal with them, and it just becomes nasty. So one promise um, I made in, in starting Sprinkler was, uh, was that we'll just focus uh, excessively on keeping clients happy. So you don't have to renew them, but if they're a client, you take care of them, or you do best. Some clients just are impossible, but you try your, your damnness. So the entire company, so that is a big focus for the entire company. So we have this um, dreaded meeting, not dreaded, you don't want to be on that call. Um, we have this company-wide senior leadership meeting every week where we go through any client that is in, in orange or red. Um, and you know we have, depending on how you look at 12, 1,300 clients. And any time a client is in, you, all senior leaders are expected to, it's like a mandatory um, meeting, and one, I'm probably the only one in the company, and the only excuse that you can have to not attend CDAP is your own funeral. <laughs> <laughs> and CDAP stands for Customer Delight Assurance Program. Assurance Program. And, and so if your client is on CDAP, then the entire food chain, you know, five, six levels of sales and account managers and services, if that's involved, everyone needs to be on it. We go through them. It's painful, but, and it, you know, as we scale, it, it gets harder and harder, but that's one thing that just really helped us a lot. Do you tie bonuses to it? Um, we do. Um, I mean, most things ultimately are tied to, to retention and growth. Um, and, and, but I, but I gotta say, you know, 95%, percent depending on the quarter we're anywhere from 92 to 98 percent retention for our type of business is really unheard of i think okay. and that's gross renewal rate um questions let's kick it off david so uh, you talk, talked about you know getting the process right or do you guys to kind of uh, to get the 
Um, so you both talked about getting the process right in order for you guys to sell six-figure deals um, without having to visit customers and stuff like that. Can you give kind of an overview of how you kind of what what those processes are and kind of like how how they kind of work for you guys? Let me take a short stab at it. I don't think there's a right process. You need to have a process. So early on, it's, it's all chaos until you find some, something repeatable. You try 100 things, something sticks. The trick is to learn what, it, what sticks and is it scalable versus luck. Usually, if it sticks enough times, it's scalable. And to create a process around it. Otherwise, you have a hodgepodge of activities and noise in the organization and you don't know who to hire and how to manage them and how to measure them. So that's to me not which process, but a process. I know we all hate that word, but it's needed there. Repeatable is, is the magic. What exactly it is, it can change between each business so, so much. Yeah, so we, um, we are, have invested in, and I'm in the middle of investing a lot more into making that all a very predictable science. A lot of times when you start out, the process that you're thinking of is just, and for simple businesses, that might be just all you need. How do I advance the sale? That's just the process of selling. Um, there is a, so many different parallel paths that you need to, to have processes defined when you're building a really scalable um, sales organization. The process of selling is one. The process of messaging as you go through your sales stages is another one. Um, the process of planning, um, which is rolling up, rolling under, um, accounting for all of that stuff, um, and especially like in, at Springler, we have five to six levels where everyone's rolling up and forecasting. And in most companies, uh, forecasting is, 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 they want it to be an art where you get to call the number. And I just freaking hate that word. <laughs> um, so we, we, we just have broken down into stages with probability and it's, it's fairly mathematical at this point. And, and, and the calling will hurt in a lot of, but that is um, the, the command of that planning process um, and, and lastly, it's a command of, of the hiring process. And I have to, um, there's a company called Force Management. So these are in, this is not my uh, discovery. I wish I'd met them and, and known this sooner, um, but there are people who have done this for a very long time who have crystallized um, thinking around this. And we've been, I've been a student, and thanks to a bunch of guys, Neeraj Connect me to originally, who have become great friends. Um, and you have all these dimensions and you are creating process frameworks for all of them. Maddie, go ahead. If people could wait until they get a mic to ask questions, just a quick announcement for the whole audience so the cameras can get the sound and it's not just blank. Cool. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So uh, I'm in the process of evaluating force management as well. Is there a particular time where it makes more sense uh, than others? Um, because it's not cheap. It, they're not cheap, and, and, and uh, here's in my, it's tempting to think that force management will come in and solve your problem. That's a phrase that I've heard John, who's a, who's now become a very, very dear friend. Uh, this is a person named John McMahon who ran sales at PTC just for. for and I was talking about John Kaplan. But sorry, John Kaplan, <laughs> who's also at force management. Is a, is, is a, exactly. <laughs> yeah, hi, uh, John. Now, it says participating in your own rescue. Right. What that means is force doesn't, they come with a structure. That structure is imposed on your organization. But if your organization does not have its messaging, if the organization does not have its value prop, if it doesn't have your preliminary selling motion down, you're going to fail. Mm -hmm. So force will only work after you have figured out how to sell and your business is really working and you want structure on it to get predictable. Uh, that's my assessment. Great. Um, is there a question in the front here? I was curious, how do you think about um, the value or uh, the value of marketing and communications in relation to sales? Like, how does that, is it a part of, how do you separate them or how do you collaborate them? Do you include product marketing in that? Question. Yeah, I, mean, I guess uh, I was. Yeah, I, I guess I was more talking about. I thought what you said before that uh, uh, price is a communication is a messaging and a communication. Yeah. I thought it was really interesting. So then it's about how do you distribute that messaging? And does that come back and shape um, some of your sales strategies and approach? And so my view is again, I was head of product right and marketing in the past before I became uh, CEO. So my view is that one of the key tricks is to have one singular message for the entire company. 
so many companies make that mistake and optimize locally the message. And you can't build a, an, an empire, right? And we all want to build an empire at the end with multiple local, sub-localized messages. And to do that, you need to have a single owner of the message of the company. In my view, that owner is actually product, not marketing. Marketing executes the message, and sales deliver the message right, accordingly. Um, but product owns the message and the positioning. And they provide the tools. Um, and I've had multiple times in my life that I had to force sales to use a certain new positioning or a new message. Everyone are used to something they used. They have a local file, C drive, slash docs, and they use it. And it's very difficult to detach them from that and put in a new message. But the message evolves. And the organization has to stick to one message. Otherwise, you confuse the heck out of the market. So in my view, it's crucial. It has to be centralized, um, not in sales. There's a profession about positioning and right and so on. Um, so in my view, it's, it's critical for success and repetitive processes and growth and all the good stuff we want to achieve. I, I, Amir, give people a sense. What, sales and marketing as a budget, if you had to estimate. How much is marketing? How much is sales? Rough numbers. So marketing also has SDRs in Slicense. So let's take SDRs out, right? Okay. Sales development, lead gen development reps. Uh, marketing, sales is bigger than marketing. Marketing is more a false multiplier than sales. Round, sales round numbers, 1090, 2575, 5050. No, no. Um, probably two to one ratio when I take the SDRs out, maybe three to one. Three to one depends. If you put SDRs in sales, maybe three to one. Yeah, I need, I need, to, I need to do math now with the yeah. SDRs. Yeah. Probably three to one with the SDRs moving to sales. Raji, how about you? What do you think the ratio is? Um, for us, it's, uh, it's uh, I would, I'm a believer that if you just take the universe of sales and marketing, it's probably 80, 20, or 85, 15. Sales? Yeah. Interesting. Hey, Dave, I'm going to cold call on you. Uh, Dave is CEO of Blade Logic, one of batteries companies I've known him for a long time. Dave, what do you think about the ratio of sales and marketing, sales versus marketing? What's your experience? Times have changed, but at Blade Logic, I would say it was about uh, 95 5 sales to marketing. Um, and um, but um, one of the things that has changed is that customers are much more sophisticated. And before you even talk to them, they think they already know everything about your product, about your company, and you know, and they're going to make the decision without your involvement. So you have to spend a lot more time and energy getting up, getting to uh, get educate them earlier in the process. So inbound demand gen has become a real data science. So we're making a lot of investments in, in inbound demand gen to essentially educate our customers uh, earlier and allow us to filter them. And two, because we're an open source company, um, unlike closed source companies, we spend a lot of money on adoption and, and evangelizing our product, just getting developer mind share out there, which is something closed source companies don't have to do because you can pick and choose your customers where anyone can download our software. So we need some avenues to educate them and train them. So we make a lot of investments early on. Now, those investments stay flat because you have to build up a certain critical mass and over time, as a percentage of our total spend, that will come down. Hey, Dave, is the CEO of MongoDB. Just, what's the ratio split right now? What do you think, 75, 25, 50, 50? Give people a sense. Um, it is probably about, uh, it's somewhere between two to three to one. So let me double click on that, because I thought, as we spoke, first of all, it's three to one right now. I recall my CAC calculation exactly, three to one. But my previous company, this is the inside sales organization, lead gen oriented inside sales. My previous organization was 100% enterprise sales. It was easily nine to one, easily nine to one where marketing was kind of artillery, but that's it. We didn't do almost any lead gen. It was the sales guy knocking on the door, hopefully good PR, good, right, good events, et cetera. So I think that's the, also the difference between our businesses and that business. Enterprise sales will be much more nine to one, whatever, it, inside. Yeah, I mean, I, and I don't know whether your original question was about how does sales and marketing work with each other and, and enhance or not enhance each other. Uh, but if you look at marketing independently, all this is good. Um, I, I, I want to say very thoughtfully that marketing is your worst sales guy's best excuse. Say that again? Marketing is your worst sales guy's best excuse. Okay. Good. Well, one last question, and hopefully we didn't create any marketing people to lose their jobs today. <laughs> Daniel. Hey guys, uh, wondering how you handle uh, FUD, fear, uncertainty, doubt, as you encounter it from others or as you create it on your own. Wow. You, yeah, I mean, you answer FUD with the product. That's what you answer. You don't answer FUD with FUD. 
Um, uh, and this is early on, you know, we were in the social media management space um, currently, and there was a lot of FUD in our space when we got started. And it's much easier in a connected world as we are now. So what you do is you deliver the product. Uh, if your product is better than everyone, then your clients will speak, um, shout from rooftops for you. And that's how you deal with it. I believe spreading FUD is very short term and will blow up in your face. You lose credibility. Um, you lose the high ground. It, it doesn't work in the long term. Even Forget if it's right or wrong. I think it's also wrong, but it doesn't work in the long run. Uh, so actually, when I catch a sales guy doing that, it's usually because he's incapable. That's the only thing he knows, right, to spread FUD. It's not a sustainable business. When we hear it on the other direction, we actually use it as a, as, a, as a leverage point. You heard all of that, but here are the amazing results we have. Why don't you try it out for 90 minutes? Do a quick POC. So you can turn it into a, a, an event, right? Because you have now a dissonance between the FUD and the Gartner results, testimonials, and so on. And you almost force the client to, to admit that there's a dissonance and he should try it out himself. So to me, you can leverage it in a good way. All right, before we close out, I have an important question for you guys. Why do you guys think Battery Ventures is the right VC firm for all of you? <laughs> I'm just joking. Let me give a round of applause to Mir and Raji for taking their time today.